Alistair, good morning. Good morning, James. How are you today? Well, looking forward to our conversation, I must say. <laughs> yeah, a couple of things I'd like to go over. Um, you've been writing an awful lot about the dollar recently. I want to cover that. And it, more importantly, I want to talk about the dollar and its relationship to, relationship to uh, globally uh, systemic important banks, or GSIBs, yeah. which you've also written about. Uh, and the link between the two. Uh, I'm particularly concerned this year by a number of developments um, suggesting that counterparty risk is going to become increasingly important. And when you talk about counterparty risk, immediately you're thinking of banks and globally uh, systemically important banks or GSIBs. So let me, can you define what a GSIB is and how it came about? Yeah, um, it was really in the wake of the what some people call the great financial crisis. I don't call it that because I think there's an even greater one <laughs> in the wings. But let's say the Lehman uh, failure. Um, the Basically, the G20 got together and decided this must never happen again. And they produced a number of rules and changes. And one of them was the definition of global systemically important banks. And these basically are large banks whose business is very much international and therefore there is the risk of systemic risk being passed say from one jurisdiction to another and the list of these banks um, i think is in the region of about 28 29 it's certainly less than 30. Mm -hmm. all of them are listed except for one french bank um, and uh, it, it is interesting because it allows you to compare the level of balance sheet leverage uh, in one jurisdiction compared with another. And um, when you have interest rates which are stagnant or not moving or even going downwards, uh, this probably doesn't matter that much. But when you get rising interest rates, the effect on non-performing loans, just to take a very simple example, um, is to, uh, if you like, begin to erode uh, shareholders um, assets on the balance sheet and um, the other thing that this gives you is an ability to look at how the markets um, rate these banks the individual banks and very worryingly for some considerable time uh, the markets have rated them at a substantial discount to book value now, normally, if you look at, a, say, an industrial company and you see that the shares are trading at a discount to book value, you would take the you would reasonably take the view that the shares are being undervalued because even on a, um, uh, you know, on, on a, a, a corporate liquidation, there should be value there, which would go back to the shareholders in excess of the um, uh, capitalization of the company. But in banks, it's very, very different. Uh, a substantial discount to um, uh, book value really has the effect of um, telling us that the market views this as exceptionally risky. And this has been the case for some time, but so far has really been ignored. And some of we these now have a situation. Sorry. I was going to say some of these discounts have been substantial recently. I know you did a piece of, a little while back. Uh, showing that they were you know, 20 to 50% below uh, book value. Uh, I, I think there was one or two cases even worse than that, suggesting that the capital of these banks is impaired. Um, and as a consequence, you know, they impose um, counterparty risk to people who have money on deposit in those banks. Yes, it's not just, it's not just um, uh, the depositors' um, uh, problems. Um, I think we, we must assume uh, that um, if one of these banks fails, it will be rescued. Uh, because to assume otherwise, I think, would be, you know, it would be inviting complete disaster. And yeah. we must accept that one of the fundamental functions of a modern central bank is to ensure the integrity of the commercial banking system. So even without that sort of failure, uh, what we are likely to see, I think, is um, uh, the central banks in effect being forced to um, rescue failing banks. And, and this is where the rating of these banks, I think, actually comes in. I mean, we saw with Credit Suisse, which is a GSIB, um, it had to be very quietly uh, rescued. 
um, and that's a process which is not yet complete. Uh, the um, uh, level of, um, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, capitalization to book value in that was um, down at one stage to around about 24, 25%. Now that's, you know, that's just option money on the bank's survival. And um, the same is roughly true with, with some other banks in the, um, in the Eurozone or in, you know, in the European arena, including banks like Deutsche Bank, Credit Agricole and uh, several others. Um, the, the, this all suggests that there is a very high likelihood of failure uh, within Europe and particularly the Eurozone. Mm. Um, and uh, we now look at that in the context of rising interest rates rather than falling or stable interest rates. Um, I think there is virtually no doubt that the long-term trend of interest rates is now up. Why? Because um, prices are rising. I mean, we know that the um, consumer price index doesn't really reflect the general level of prices, but we can see that the pressures are there and they're going to continue for some time. But rising, interest, right. rising interest rates, though, Alistair, that's going to make the GSIB problem even worse because that's going to mean more companies are unable to meet their interest payments because they're not generating sufficient cash flow in a weakening economy. Uh, which is weakening because interest rates are rising. So you're saying that GSIB problem is going to become even worse as the year progresses? Yes, um, and that's just looking at the non-financial uh, exposure of the GSIBs. The financial exposure is something else. The other thing about rising interest rates is, of course, you get falling asset values and um, rising bond yields, which means falling values. Uh, is, that and, what you, uh, is, that, is that what you mean by the financial exposure as opposed to the non-financial exposure? Or could you explain exactly? That ex yeah. Yes, yes. And, and that's only part of it, because you've also got the, um, the shadow banking system, which doesn't create credit as such. But what the shadow banking system does is it borrows at very low interest rates in order to gain an uplift. Uh, by buying investments which have a higher rate of interest. So, um, you know, there is a mismatch there, which uh, in, in, in falling asset values, financial asset values, begins to come unstuck. Um, I, one of the areas where there is already a lot of pain being felt, but isn't really hitting the headlines yet, uh, is private equity uh, in America, which um, has been investing quite heavily in commercial property. And as I understand it, commercial property values in America have fallen in the order of about 13 or 14 percent so far. That is a process which is likely to continue as borrowing rates for mortgages, if you like, continue to to rise over time. So this is a this is a very widespread problem. And yeah. um, I was also interested, I mean, Ken Rogoff, who I wouldn't say was, um, you know, an Austrian economist or if you like a classical economist in, in any sense, um, warned at the World Economic Forum, I think it was yesterday um, on the first day, of precisely this danger that rising interest rates are going to upset the whole caboodle. And I mean, he basically, um, uh, I, I would have him as an inflationist. He is uh, producing an argument why the central banks should not raise interest rates. They should sit on interest rates and keep them suppressed, or else the whole financial system is likely to collapse. Mm -hmm. Now, I could have written that script for him, and so could you, because we have that's more or less what we have been saying for some considerable time. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, you know, so... I think that it's important when someone like Ken Rogoff makes uh, uh, speeches and statements of this sort, he is going to be listened to a lot more than, say, uh, you and I by the general public. And I think there is going to be a, a growing awareness of this problem. Now, how it interacts with um, monetary policy, we have yet to see. But you can see how we do face these dangers more immediately than we have um, in the past. And I would think that it's not very long before this is going to become a real issue in front of us. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I'd like to go back to the 70s, you know, which we both very well remember and you know, yeah. lived and, and worked through, and specifically uh, the early 1970s before inflation started taking off. I'm very fond of 
um, the fact that history sometimes does repeat. And I keep being reminded of the Herstadt Bank collapse uh, yeah. in 1974. Uh, I was living and working in Asia at the time. You were living and working in London at the time. So we both saw the consequences of that, um, it, which were particularly severe in the UK because of the amount of debt that had been taken on at that moment in time. Yeah. But what happened with Herstadt Bank was it was a medium-sized West German bank. Deutsche Marks were paid into it during the course of the German working day. And it was supposed to pay out dollars uh, through Chase Manhattan later in the day uh, when, the New when the New York markets opened six hours later. But what happened is before the New York markets opened, Herstadt Bank declared bankruptcy and those dollars never got paid out. And it had a knock-on effect throughout the global monetary system. And I guess that may have been the origin or probably one of the um, wake-up calls to the uh, banking regulators about you know, GSIBs and the, the, the impact. And ever since, banks have been trying to deal with the fact that currency today is a liability rather than a tangible asset. Yeah. Uh, it's a liability of these banks. You know, you'd mentioned earlier about bank balance sheets. And that when you're dealing with liabilities, in order to keep balance sheets in balance uh, among the banks, every day at three o'clock, they borrow and lend to each other. Um, the deposit currency that's flowing around throughout the system in order to bring balance sheets back into balance. And that's what creates the, the counterparty mm. risk is when the balance sheets don't balance and banks are willing to lend to other banks. Uh, you know, some banks receive deposits during the case of a day, other banks lose deposits during the course of a day, and they have to bring those back into balance. I guess what I'm getting at, Alistair, is, you know, I'm sort of seeing the early 1970s problems repeating. Um, and you know, I keep looking for shots across the bow or pieces of evidence that, you know, we're, we're in for some tough times ahead. And the rise of globally systemically important banks or GSIBs and the issues relating to that reminds me an awful lot of the early 1970s. Would you agree with yeah. that? I would agree with that. Um, what I would like uh, is, is uh, uh, would I be right in thinking that the problem with Herstadt, from what you say, is that they were short of Deutschmarks and long of do dollar obligations. And the uh, move in the Deutschmark, which was always a strong currency, even on very low interest rates, was really what did for the bank. Would I be right in assuming that that was the fundamental problem? Yeah, they, they had foreign exchange exposure and they, have, they had lost uh, a lot of money in foreign exchange. Um, so it was a bad bank. Uh, they were operating, and as far as the people who deposited Deutschmarks and the expectation that dollars were going to be paid out later in the day when Chase Manhattan Bank opened, uh, they thought that the bank was was liquid and solvent. Uh, and in fact, it was neither. And I think that's probably true about a lot of the banks today. Uh, they appear to be liquid, um, and maybe they appear to be solvent. But when you really look at the value of their assets as the the markets are telling us in terms of market price being below book value of a lot of these banks, they probably probably really are not solvent. And as long as you're dealing with these liabilities circulating as currency, you're always going to have this clearing and settlement problem. You're always going to have GSIBs and you're always mm -hmm. going to have counterparty risk, which I guess let's move into the dollar side of that. Um, you know, now that the dollar okay, be be before we before we move into the dollar side, um, I'm just interested in your Herstadt uh, example, because um, would I be right in thinking that it is, if you like, uh, a forerunner of the situation the Japanese banks uh, have today? I mean, we saw the Japanese yen weaken very substantially. I think it got up to something like 150 to the dollar, something like yeah, that. I mean, it was almost, close yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, and now it's back down to below 130. Uh, we see that um, the Bank of Japan is unable to suppress the yield on the 10-year uh, uh, Treasury uh, Bank of, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Japanese government bond uh, below um, its new target range of 0.5%. And as this is being recorded, in fact, it's jumped this morning above the 0.5% to um, uh, uh, I think around about 0.52%. And the currency swaps market are telling us that the correct rate actually is 1%. Now, um, I'm just sort of thinking about the Herstadt example in the sense that um, banks and others will be long dollar, short of the uh, uh, yen, and they are getting royally screwed by this uh, switch, if you like, 
in interest rate uh, emphasis away from the dollar, where everybody says, well, you know, another rise or two and that's it, uh, to a situation developing in Japan, where after decades, literally decades of zero interest rates, suddenly uh, this huge mountain of yen debt, government debt, as well as uh, uh, corporate debt uh, in, in Japan, and also uh, the carry trade where uh, the yen has been sold in order to pick up the yield in dollars, which I think the Bank of International Settlements has uh, uh, estimated was a further 80 trillion dollars equivalent uh, unrecorded on bank balance sheets uh, because, you know, through through, um, uh, uh, you know, futures and forwards um, it's just the current value of a contract that's recorded, not the eventual settlement value. So we've got, you know, potentially, uh, I think, Herstadt on on steroids by the look of it, just on that Japanese situation. And that is in front of us now. Yeah, you're right. And there was a carry trade issue back in the early 1970s as well because of the differential and in interest rates between the Deutsche Mark and the dollar. The dollar being a much higher interest rate than the Deutsche Mark, Deutsche Mark being a, a very yeah. sound currency or hard currency at the time, uh, it in the Swiss francs. So, uh, you know, even in that respect too, history is repeating and repeating. And, you know, maybe we should be focusing too on Japan as a potential flashpoint. Um, yeah. uh, bringing problems to the international banking system, which obviously has impacts for the dollar and, and the gold price, which uh, continues to chug away higher, eating through overhead resistance. Uh, um, just below you know, uh, 2000, it's chugging through the 1900s now, and I think it's going to head to 2000 in the not too distant future, but you know, time will tell, we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, but the I think the key point is, is that when you're dealing with banks, you're dealing with their liabilities. When you're dealing with physical gold, you have a tangible asset which you control. Um, and I think that's going to become increasingly important this year. You want control over your assets. You don't want to be, be reliant upon banks uh, for uh, those assets. Anyway, let's get into the dollar itself. Uh, I know you've been very bearish about the dollar and you've been talking about 2023 years, a make or break year for the dollar. And I completely agree with you on that. What's your latest thinking? I, my latest thinking is that um, there the, are the two elements to this. There is the economic element, which we can uh, can discuss. And, and basically, um, everybody's got the dollar. Um, you know, the idea that uh, the dollar is now a safe haven from other currencies is no longer true. Um, there's something like 14 trillion um, uh, dollars um, invested in uh, uh, corporate stocks. So this is a portfolio effect. Now, what happens when you get hit by a recession? Um, basically, foreigners move out of foreign markets, which they see as risk exposure, which they don't need, need to have, into their own domestic markets. And, uh, you know, this is a very, very natural thing. So there's around about $14 trillion worth of uh, equity exposure. It's probably down to 12 now through valuation changes. But you can see that there is a, 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 a real overhang of dollars and dollar financial assets that will be sold in a continuing bear market driven by a longer term trend of rising interest rates. So I think that's the first point I would make. Um, well, there's a subsidiary point to that before I move on to the geopolitical. Uh, the subsidiary point is that um, on rising interest rates, it's going to be increasingly difficult for the US government to fund itself. Um, and going back to the 1970s, we saw this in spades in the UK. I mean, uh, believe it or not, uh, the British government was forced to issue 15 year treasury stock maturity, that is, uh, with a coupon of 15 and a half percent. You know, imagine imagine that situation returning. Um, I'm not saying that it'll necessarily return, but you can see the effects on government finances of this debt trap, which um, not just the uh, uh, the U.S. government, but also all Western governments have actually willingly entered into. I mean, you know, it's it's rather like you know you go fishing, you have a you know you have a net, and you entrap fish. These fish, government fish, have swum willingly into the net, um, you know, without any regard to their future uh, survivability. And that is going to be a real challenge. And when you see that the only outcome from this is an acceleration 
of um, the issuance, the, the degra degradation of paper money, then the idea that the whole of this sort of inflation story is dying along with, you know, COVID's now gone, um, supply chain problems have gone, Putin will be defeated, so, you know, energy prices will fall again. I mean, you know, that is not actually the reality of the situation. So that, I think, is the economic situation. The geopolitical situation for the dollar, I think, is equally alarming. And this was highlighted by President Putin um, in uh, June at uh, the St. Petersburg International Forum, which was attended by 81 government delegations. So we're not talking about, you know, something, um, you know, sort of on the fringe, if you like, of uh, international governments. We're talking about something which is actually central to, well, certainly the whole of Asia and a lot of the nations who are not firmly in the dollar camp. Um, what he said there was um, that if you hold on to dollars and euros, you're going to be losing roughly 8%. That was the rough rate of inflation at that time uh, in, in, in its purchasing power. Furthermore, um, at the stroke of a pen, uh, the Americans can um, uh, render your reserves completely useless. So why hold them? Um, and he was really um, uh, repeating pretty much what uh, Zoltan Pozar was saying, and that is that Bretton Woods III, which, you know, his, his, his term for this new era, uh, is going to be a migration from currencies backed by full faith and credit but nothing else, to currencies which have some sort of commodity backing or involvement or whatever. And um, these 81 um, uh, official delegations are fully aware of where this is going. And we also... Uh, we also saw back in, in uh, um, uh, December, uh, President Xi going to visit Saudi Arabia. And guess what? We have the birth of the Petro Yuan and um, the suicide note for the Petro dollar. I mean, it's not going to disappear immediately, but you can see which way this is going. Uh, and uh, they're also talking about currency reform in Asia. And the idea there, I mean, nothing tangible has come out of it, but the idea there, quite simply, is to provide a safer haven for these 81 um, uh, nations that attended the St. Petersburg International Forum uh, than um, just holding reserve dollars. So I think, I think uh, 2023 is going to be a very important year in currency markets. And I think we're going to see a fundamental shift away from the dollar as the world's reserve currency. And the implications of that are very important because uh, America so far has shown a huge reluctance to accept uh, the loss of its role as the world's policeman, its hegemony, if you like. So that's that, that, to my mind, these are the two things. I think you can see it on the economic point of view. There is huge, huge amounts of dollars to be sold because of portfolio effects and rising interest rates on bond yields and so on. And you've also got the geopolitical. And uh, this, to me, is, is, is uh, the makings of a catastrophe for the dollar. And you also have it showing up in the market itself. The dollar index peaked at 114 not too long ago. Um, it, you know, For a while, it came down to 104, 105 area, moved sideways, holding support. Recently, it's broken below 104. Uh, it's now in the 102 area. If it breaks that, that's the last line of support before it really heads a lot lower. So the market is basically confirming what you're saying, Alistair. It should be a, a, an interesting, interesting year and probably a monumental one when we look back years from now. Mm. Thank you very much, Alistair. It's really been great chatting with you. Let's do this again in the not too distant future as the year unfolds. I'd love to do that. Thank you for setting it up, James. Thanks, Alistair. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.